Good morning and welcome. I'm Gloria Washington, an instructional designer at the Center for Teaching Excellence. Jennifer Lau, who is also an instructional designer, is attending this webinar as well. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, 3Ds, Develop, Building, an Online Course. Today's webinar facilitator is Casey Carroll, an instructional designer at the Center for Teaching Excellence. Please join me in wel welcoming our webinar facilitator by typing welcome or hello in the chat box. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as Gloria said, I'm Casey Carroll. I'm an instructional designer with CTC. I'm very happy to have all of you with us um, and so that we can um, learn a little bit about kind of the next steps in prepping your online course and learn about kind of what it takes to kind of get it from your planning stage to your delivery or actual teaching stage. So great, thanks everybody. Um, okay, so um, our first webinar in this series is designed focused on how to plan and design an effective online course. Um, so we talked about back of design, writing objectives and planning modules, um, and how to write a good syllabus. So uh, today we'll be focusing on um, looking at kind of quality, accessibility, selecting materials, and setting up your classroom in Blackboard, as long as a, a couple of different things that you want to start considering about the kind of tools that you, uh, technology tools that you might want to use to prep your course materials. Uh, as a presenter or a moderator, um, when you are, when you do a poll, it can actually, uh, it puts the answer next to the name in the attendees list, right? So um, I'm not going to make everybody a presenter right now, but um, if you uh, do have that role and you can see the attendees list, um, you can see who answers. So this way it keeps it anonymous for the students um, so that they can't see what their, their colleagues answered, um, but uh, you, the presenter, can. Um, so the next time that you use polls, make sure to have that attendees list pulled up and you'll be able to see it just right next to everybody's name on the list. All right. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about a little bit, so we'll talk about a, a couple of things to consider as you are moving kind of from the, the syllabus planning stage to um, the development stage. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is these quality assurance standards. Um, so this is a little bit of a, a, a deep dive kind of a thing. Um, and so since not a ton of us um, are kind of actively going to be teaching online, I'm not going to spend too much time here. Um, but the idea here is, is that there is, there are quality standards or industry standards uh, for what makes a quality designed online course. And so these are um, taken into consideration for a fully online course. Um, not necessarily a hybrid or um, a face-to-face course, but these are things to consider as you're starting to kind of really develop your course. Uh, these are the most important pieces. Uh, and then if you actually look at the quality assurance rubric, there is a, a lot of things that you can do in detail. Um, and if you want to learn more about those details, um, we can uh, share the rubric with everybody or we can um, feel free to get kind of a consultation with y'all. So these are what we use on our campus to kind of do quality assurance, um, quality reviews of courses, um, which are not necessarily mandatory, but we do uh, do them if you're planning a course. So it's best to do it, we can do it after you've kind of planned your initial course, it's best to do it after you've taught at least once to kind of see where you want to improve. So the main things to consider here are these nine domains of standards. So these are the nine big categories. And then within those categories, there are actually 49 specific standards. Um, so the first category is course overview and introduction. So this includes guidance and giving students all the information that they need to be successful in the course. Learning outcomes and objectives. So this lets students know what measurable skills they should master by the end of the course. Uh, and this is both at a course level uh, kind of the, the big picture things, and then also we break it down into a module level, which we'll see uh, here in a couple of minutes. 
As assessment and measurement guides development of meaningful assignments and assessments that measure student progress toward the learning objectives. Instructional materials should be a variety of current and course appropriate materials that clearly support the learning objectives. Course activities and learner interaction should promote the achievement of the course objectives and provide plenty of opportunity for students to interact with each other. Course technology should be current and easy to use. Also, they should promote student engagement and active learning. Learner support, uh, so you want to make sure to tell students about the support services the university offers, including help with coursework and technology, and also how to find that support. Uh, and this may be different depending upon if your students are fully online students that in Columbia, so you will want to make sure to kind of give them all the options that are necessary. Uh, and we have some resources for that. Um, accessibility uh, and usability. Uh, later I'll share some ways, uh, here in just a minute, I will share some ways to make sure your online course is accessible to students under university and ADA guidelines and to make sure that your course format is intuitive and easy for students to navigate. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is talk a little bit about accessibility and usability. So usability refers to course navigation, information on technology accessibility, readability, and ease of use. So as, as although we're not going to focus too intensely on the mechanics of accomplishing these things in this webinar, uh, we want to bring this to your attention to make sure that you uh, and the, the need to ensure that all materials provided to students in an online course are accessible from day one. Uh, you may have students that do not have declared disabilities as well as prefer learning in different methods uh, or second language learners who benefit from accessible content. The navigation refers to the process of planning, controlling, and recording the movement of a student from one place to another in the online course. You should ensure that navigation throughout the course is consistent logical and efficient. The course's navigation strategy should make it easy to move through the course and course activities. The most aspects of the CPE template, uh, which we'll see here in a couple of minutes, are geared towards course usability from a student's perspective. You should ensure that course in the course includes links to accessibility statements for all required technology. If an accessibility statement does not exist for a particular technology, you just need to say that. You should ensure that course design elements maximize usability, facilitating readability, and minimizing distractions. You should ensure that course content is clearly presented so that students can easily read and interpret it. This includes color combinations, font style and size, white space, content format, text background, and, uh, and sufficient contrast. Multimedia refers to uh, images, audio, animation, video, and interactive components used for content or feedback. Uh, these multimedia objects should be easy to use, intelligible, and interoperational across devices. You should ensure that course multimedia are easy to view, operate, and interpret. Um, similarly, these are kind of the big things to look for with accessibility. Uh, this is very important in course development. Um, so a lot of what you can do to make a course accessible is e pretty easy to do, especially if you do it from the beginning. Um, the, the times that I see people ending up taking a lot of time to deal with accessibility is often when they have to convert materials from a non-accessible format to an accessible format. So if you're aware of these things ahead of time, you can actually start going ahead and doing that. Um, so we've got about... Um, uh, kind of six main things here that you can start doing. Uh, so you'll want to use technology that is accessible for everyone and also includes guidance on how to obtain accommodation. Um, if you include a PDF, you'll want to make sure that optical character recognition has been performed or scanned on the scanned PDF files before being posted, physical character recognition or OCR. Um, Adobe Pro is a tool that can OCR your PDF. Um, so you're just checking the see that something is scanned and saved as a PDF and not just as an image. Um, you can also use uh, Blackboard to actually convert scanned PDFs into converted OCR PDFs as well um, with a tool called Blackboard Ally. Um, so without going into too much detail, if you look at documents in your Blackboard course, um, there should be like a little uh, arrow next to it. And one of the options is um, uh, 
uh, other formats um, or accessible formats, and that will allow you to uh, convert. And it actually works for a, a number of different formats, not just for PDFs. So if your PDF files are not accessible um, and you can't really make them accessible, you can also post the Word document equivalent or link to an HTML equivalent if you have it. Uh, this allows your students to manipulate content to make it more usable for them individually, so those formats are more access, more easy to change for students in a PDF. Um, so make sure that your uh, posted documents, so Word, Excel, PowerPoint, are accessible and usable by screen readers. Um, and most of uh, all three of those actually will uh, walk you through with the accessibility checker. Um, so videos and audio files need to be captioned or accompanied by a transcript posted at the same time. Uh, you may have students that do not have declared disabilities, um, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, so it's always best to write out your transcript before you record uh, for best, pro best production quality, but mostly to save you time for transcription. So there are speech text programs in YouTube that will capture mechanical transcripts which can save you time in writing out your scripts, but you still need to edit them, which can be time consuming. Um, so the last one there, that some students only use their computer keyboard to access content due to limited motor function. Uh, all technology and content you use should be accessible without a mouse. Um, so one thing we're gonna make a note of is uh, if you do use publisher content, um, that's not always 100% ADA compliant, um, especially, I see a lot of public uh, PowerPoint that are kind of a mess when it comes to accessibility. Um, so if you're using publisher content, just know ahead of time that it is uh, not automatically accessible. Uh, and you can actually uh, work with the publisher or even just kind of request, uh, and that's enough to actually request from them to provide accessible or alternative content, um, they will get on it. Um, so um, uh, in terms of these things, CT has uh, ongoing workshops go into much more detail for these things as well. So feel free to uh, contact us if you want some help with this. Um, the Student Disability Resource Center is also a great resource uh, and any of the workshops that we offer. So in line with the backwards design uh, that we talked about last session, um, we're gonna look a little bit about selecting instructional materials. So these should be aimed at giving students the tools that they need to be able to master the learning objectives you identified for the course. So these are not things that you will assess, right? So you can't assign points for doing the reading or for watching a video. You can try, but it's really hard to document or it's impossible to document in some cases. So these are all kind of background information that should hopefully lead students to be able to successfully do the activities and assessments that you've designed for them. Um, so when you're looking at uh, the right resources for your online course, uh, make sure that um, students have different learning tendencies, so make sure to include a variety of information sources and instructional methods. So here are a couple of options. So we just mentioned publisher content. Um, a, a lot of uh, publishers are now producing a lot of digital content, so that's different from even just digital textbooks, but there are a lot of um, Especially, I, I work with a lot of courses that do Pearson, um, my lab, uh, which involve a lot of opportunities for practice. They do offer those PowerPoints, a lot of those kinds of things. Um, so uh, it allows uh, a, a better variety of content-related tools and enhancements for you to consider. Um, uh, if you have published your content, we can work with you to see if you can incorporate it into Blackboard. So for most of the big publishers, those are already um, uh, available. Um, and then we can kind of work with you and the publishing rep to kind of see how we can best uh, integrate those things. So textbooks, um, so even though publisher content can be positive, textbooks are expensive and can be difficult to update. Uh, so one option you might want to consider are open educational resources or OARs. These are educational materials that are offered freely online for anyone to use. So most OER licenses allow the resources to be shared, remixed, or customized for your class. So these include things like textbooks, course materials, uh, videos, and there's even tests or software to support access to knowledge. Um, so these are produced, uh, a lot of universities produce 
and some other companies produce them as well. And sometimes individuals just create materials and just put it online with like a Creative Commons license or something like that. Um, so the best uh, resource for this is the Thomas Cooper Library. Um, so they have a whole page for OERs. Um, I'll send a link out with that as well. Um, so the, the library itself is a great resource for all of your instructional materials, um, including multimedia content. So if you know what you're looking for, but you aren't sure where to find it or what copyright issues that you may have involved, ask the librarian. Um, my personal favorite uh, resource at the moment, especially with being at a distance, uh, is the chat function. So if you go to the library's homepage and you go to, um, uh, there should be like a link for Ask a Librarian or there should be somewhere for Contact Us. Uh, and one of the options is the chat. So during pretty much regular library hours, regular business hours, there's always somebody available on the other end of the chat. And the first person is usually a reference librarian um, and they can, um, uh, if you can ask the question and if they're not the right person at the library to answer the question, they'll get you to the right person. And so it's a great place to start if you're not sure where to go. Um, and they're just, it's a really, really great. Um, yeah, as, as Zara mentioned, there, there is a tracking view option for certain things. Um, but, but like she mentioned, there's, it's really hard to teach with that tool. Like for a lot of things, if you have a document posted um, in like an item, for example, you, you can't really track opening the item. Um, I, I, and so like if you have a video or a document, I think like you can, it, it just tells you whether or not they opened it, which isn't really a lot of information. Um, so really the, the really the best thing to do is to make sure that you have something in the course that is active for students, because even if you're tracking whether or not they opened in a piece of instructional material, that's still not active engagement, right? So great, thanks, Zach. Um, uh, so the Thomas Cooper Library has um, multimedia materials. Um, they have uh, streaming film resources that are licensed to be used in class or even on Blackboard. Um, they have a bunch of different stuff, PBS series, civil rights, digital library. Um, and if they don't have access, sometimes they can actually purchase it. Um, and uh, you can also work with the library to upload reserve materials into Blackboard for you. Um, so they can actually, uh, uh, they have a, a great scan and deliver service in general, but also if you um, have just kind of a list of articles you want to use or a list of materials, they can actually um, find and scan those library materials or links to resources, um, as well as address copyright concerns. And they can actually um, co complete those e-reserves for you and upload it into a content collection that you can then link to in your Blackboard course. And so they actually put it into Blackboard. They don't put it directly into your modules. You still have to do that. Uh, but they put everything right in there for you. So it's a really, really great service and they're really great about it. Um, if you do want to do something like that, I recommend um, as soon as you have your materials selected, contact them. They usually recommend at least two weeks before the semester starts. But I would say even especially in August, I would say no, no later than August 1st, as long as you have everything prepped. Um, that will give them lots of time because a lot of people do it and there's only so many of them. Um, uh, I could go on about the library for hours. Um, it's our library in particular is really, really great. Um, so uh, if you want to create your own content, we'll talk a little bit about it now, a little bit about the tools in a minute. Um, when you're planning your uh, instructor created documents for videos, especially with videos, uh, make sure that you follow the rule of 20. So your uh, lecture presentation, if you're recording a uh, lecture material, um, make sure to never go over 20 minutes, That's the absolute longest. Um, if your content goes beyond that, you can divide it in shorter segments. I believe that you should be short dividing it into shorter segments anyway. It makes it easier to record content, uh, re-record content later. It makes it easier to kind of chunk things by topics so students know where to go back and review. Um, and for you to go back and even if you need to review or update things. Um, make sure that you are organizing your content uh, and making sure that the, the beginning part of any presentation should capture the student's attention, cover the learning goals, even if it is a short, uh, short video, it should still have concrete, concrete goals or objectives. 
um, and make sure that you're connecting back to students' prior knowledge to what they're about to learn. So after you present in the material, the closing should kind of quickly summarize what you've covered. Make sure to, to uh, chunk learning content into parts so you can break down the content into smaller, more manageable chunks. Um, and to also kind of separate these out by activities. So if you do a lot of smaller videos, every single one doesn't have to have an activity uh, attached. Um, but that's going to be the best way, like we said, to um, track engagement, to be able to see how they're doing, and the best ways for them to practice the principles that you're addressing in the lecture. Um, and then these same principles apply in face-to-face -face courses. If you have a 50-minute lecture, you are most likely not going to hopefully lecture for the entire 50 minutes, but you may talk for 10 or 15 minutes, kind of what I'm doing here today, and then have an activity for application like we'll have here in a couple minutes. Um, so uh, finally, you want to make sure, uh, so research suggests that requiring students to complete a post-lecture assignment reinforces the concepts covered uh, and encourages knowledge application. Um, that's a great question, Azar. So Azar's question is, how do you recommend um, assigning activities to videos? So I wouldn't necessarily assign an activity to a video. So what I would probably do is the way that I, the way that, um, and Gloria, Jennifer, you can um, bring in other ideas here if you want, but the way that I would structure it is if uh, within the module that I have, and we'll look at an, an example of a module structure here in a second, I would put everything in the order that I want them to complete it, uh, including the task list that kind of says, this is the order I want you to complete it as like a checklist. Um, and so what it would be is, for example, video one, and then the next thing in the list would be a discussion board or would be a, a short quiz or something. Um, there are some tools that can directly put, um, I'm not really familiar with the good ones right now. I have heard Loom is good, but I haven't had the time to research it yet. So um, I can't fully endorse it, but I think Loom is something that can um, incorporate quizzes or little quiz questions into a video. Um, but more so, I would kind of structure the, the video to the activity. So um, it, it's not about um, forcing them to watch the video before the activity necessarily. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's more about kind of putting things in the order. And honestly, there, I personally feel like students deserve the kind of freedom to engage with materials in the orders that they want to. So I do think that they're going to produce the best content if they do a quiz or something after they engage with the lecture material. Um, but if, but I don't believe from my own kind of personal philosophy that we should be forcing them to do anything in any particular order. Um, and some people disagree with that. Um, and there are some people that want to kind of force that order. Uh, and that's okay too. Um, but I think I would more so kind of lead them through and even as you're explaining the course, explaining the module, saying I put these things in this order for this reason, you're gonna get the best results in these activities if you engage with the lecture first, um, especially if you design the activities in such a way that they are not necessarily completable without information from the lecture, that's gonna be the best way, um, especially um, the, the best way to, to get students to have that realization. Um, and sometimes that is a lesson that is learned over the course of the first couple of weeks, where students will will learn that they need to be engaging with these things in order to be successful. Um, uh, gotcha. So yeah, exactly. Um, so if you have that kind of structure in the module, but uh, the, the more that you can lead them through with, with the task list, with kind of those instructions, um, sometimes with the weekly announcements, things like that too, that can be helpful as well. Great question, thanks. Um, all right, so the last thing I wanna do before we do some additional chatting real fast is talk very briefly about rubrics. So um, speaking of kind of those expectations, right? Um, so if you have expectations for those activities, um, some of those things can, can be kind of simpler, what we would call formative uh, versus summative assessment. So some of these things, if you're doing like a reading check or a discussion post, sometimes you want them to be practiced uh, where you're not necessarily 
grading for you did everything correct, but rather you, but you can still put grading criteria, still put expectations in, right? And so the more expectations that you give to students, the uh, more that they'll know to be able to accomplish them. So one of these ways is through rubric. This can also help you. Um, so uh, it can ensure a very clear understanding on the part of the student for what you're expecting. So both students and instructors benefit from rubrics as instructions are clear for students and grading is actually made much easier for instructors. Um, so your expectations for high quality submission can be made clear to your students and you can focus your assessment on the identified criteria. Um, the, the grade the student receives is supported and documented by the application of the rubric scoring. Some of the instructors I work with sometimes get um, frustrated when students aren't necessarily doing the things that they wanted them to do. Um, and I try to encourage them to use this kind of a grading because even a rubric is not an objective grading criteria necessarily. There's still going to be some of that human subjective uh, element coming in, but it can help you focus on the things that you predetermined were the most important parts. And so the, if there are parts that you're getting emotional about, make you can come back to these criteria to make sure that at least those things are the things that you're actually grading on. Um, so a rubric, if you're not familiar, is a scoring guide used to evaluate students' graded work. Um, so you can use specific and descriptive criteria that's provided for the evaluation of students' work and tied to the course grading policy and learning outcomes. So this explicitly addresses uh, the Quality Matters Standard 17, actually. Um, so using rubrics can help ensure consistent and more objective grading, can clarify students' expectations, can help students focus on your expectations, and reduce the number of questions that you receive by providing the rubric up front, and can provide students with electronic feedback. Um, so if you're using rubrics in Blackboard, students can actually see the rubrics and any qualitative feedback that you provide. Uh, so outside of Blackboard, you can still provide students a copy of the rubric with some accompanying feedback. Um, especially if you're doing it in Blackboard, you have to make sure that you set it up so that students can see it. So it's pretty easy to do. Um, all right, so I want to take a couple of minutes for any additional questions and to kind of talk about what we have been talking about so far. So I've got a couple of specific questions here, uh, specifically on kind of materials, um, but I'm happy to kind of take any questions or hear anything that you want to share for anything that we've talked about so far. So what kinds of materials do you tend to use? Um, are there anything that you might need to adapt depending upon your, if you're delivering your course face-to-face -face or online? Um, uh, are you going to be teaching synchronously? So similar to what we're, we're doing, if you are teaching online synchronously um, or asynchronously without these live in-person in -person sessions. Um, if there's anything else you want to share about quality courses, um, accessibility, materials, rubrics, any other questions, so feel free to go in the chat or raise your hand. Um, we do have some sample rubrics. Um, I have a rubric that I'm using for discussions at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, if you're talking about, um, also like if you Google, there's some good things too. Um, there are a lot of examples of rubrics kind of in the world. Um, I can share my uh, discussion board rubric, uh, which is super basic, honestly. So most of my discussion boards are um, about practice and just and not about necessarily grading for quality, but I do have three, so I teach a professional communications course. So there's um, an element of content, which I think is 50 points, an element of writing, uh, which is I think 30 points, and then an element of peer response, which is basically 10 points per peer response. Um, and uh, essentially, if you, it's, it's like a one line kind of a, a rubric where you did it or you didn't. Um, I think I give maybe like half points, um, but it's really not that complicated, right? Because it's more about the, the practice for that particular kind of thing. Um, if you are uh, doing activities, it's really going to be more about the activity, right? So I would recommend, um, we can, I'll share some examples, um, but it's really more about um, 
deciding what a successful application, what a successful version of this activity looks like, and then creating criteria from there. And so um, when it comes to something like a discussion board where you're mostly kind of uh, doing essentially kind of a, a, a participation kind of thing, pretty easy to use the same rubric from place to place, but for most kind of content space, most activities, um, there's you may need to be adjusting or adapting the rubric from activity to activity. Um, but I can share out some things. So if you are doing um, a synchronous session and you're trying to kind of grade on class participation or class engagement, um, you can create rubrics for that. Um, yeah, so, so I would, especially if you're trying to grade synchronous class participation, that can be really hard to grade. Um, and so there are some, some examples of that, um, but I would really, I tend to focus if I, I used to teach discussion-based kinds of questions where I would have them do activities in class, hopefully with something they could turn in. Um, and so that would be the thing that would kind of earn them the points. So if it is something that is like a quick quiz in class um, or something where they have to answer in the chat and you can just kind of be explicit in your expectations that like, this is, this is your participation, answer my question in the chat. And um, it, that can be a way to kind of accept that documentation um, that is a little less effort on your part because if you're trying to keep track of every time that somebody talks or how many times per class somebody talks, it's just, it's not a good thing to grade on and it can be really difficult, especially in the online environment for sure. But good question. Um, what else? Anything else anyone wants to ask about, share? Yeah, great. So for um, online discussions um, in general, so either in a discussion board or in a like a live session, um, uh, for discuss, make sure that these are uh, what we call open-ended questions, right? Uh, make sure that you are um, asking something, especially in a discussion board, um, asking something that is uh, relevant, um, a personal kind of question, or something and or something that is more opinion-based and less fact-based. So it, a discussion question is like. What year did the Civil War end? That's a terrible discussion question. That is a multiple choice quiz question. Um, but uh, in your opinion, what was the one most important factor in the end of the Civil War or whatever? Um, I am not a history person. Um, but those kinds of things, there will be multiple answers. There isn't necessarily, I don't know that particular topic necessarily, but there isn't necessarily a right answer, right? There may be some conflicting opinions on it. Um, and so that can lead to uh, more discussion, right? So great, thanks, Jennifer. All right, I'm happy to hear anything you have to say on these as we move along. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next section here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, we mentioned it a couple of times, but I want to talk a little bit about Blackboard. Um, so if you are familiar with, and again, use those little Zoom tools to get in there, I'll have some um, bigger versions of these in the next couple of slides. Um, so every course that's offered at USC, whether it's face-to-face, -face, hybrid, fully online, has a Blackboard course shell that is generated for it. So um, all courses are created in Blackboard using information from the registrar's office prior to the start of the semester. So essentially, as soon as that registration page opens up and you can actually see those pages, those Blackboard courses are going to start being made on the back end. So if you are the instructor of record, it will just automatically show up in your courses. And as students register, it will start to show up in their courses. Um, so, uh, each section of a course, of course, has a unique course shell. Um, and then as you're developing your course in Blackboard, it's really, this is kind of that critical part for that navigation and usability. So, especially when you're fully online, 
this Blackboard course is your digital classroom. And I think especially as we, we are more hybrid or even face-to-face, -face, this is always your digital classroom. This is a space. And so the more that you can organize it for your students, the better it will be a resource. Um, so once you've kind of designed your course using backwards design, best practices, and quality assurance standards, um, you'll be ready to start developing the course in Blackboard. So when developing the course in Blackboard, um, you do not have to start from scratch. Um, so one of our instructional designers at CPE can work with you, and we can actually provide you with a CTE Blackboard template. Um, so the template, uh, which is kind of what I've got here, is based on quality assurance standards developed from the Quality Matters rubric. Uh, the course menu is divided into three major sections. So the getting started section, course content, and resources. Um, so we recommend using announcements as the landing page, so which is the first page that students see when they come into the Blackboard course site. So with announcements, you can post timely information critical to student success. Um, so like I said, um, your live courses are connected to the registrar's office, um, but if you want to design your course, we recommend using what is called the sandbox course. Um, so have y'all heard of sandbox courses? Um, kind of tell me in the chat. Um, so what a sandbox course is, is it is a Blackboard shell that is unconnected to a live course. So this allows you to uh, build a course without uh, students being in the course. Um, and in particular, I think the most important part is, since it's not connected to the registrar's office, uh, especially early on, uh, if you are uh, working in the course, uh, in a live course, and the course doesn't make, or for some reason that section is canceled or moved or something, that whole thing will disappear. Uh, and so it can take a lot of that work with you. So we really recommend for online courses, sandbox courses. So if you are interested in the CT template and or a sandbox course, please feel free to contact um, CTE, one of our instructional designers. Um, so Alexis, what I just mentioned essentially is um, for a sandbox course, um, you don't find them, they are created for you and you alone. Um, and so uh, what we can do, you can order a sandbox course from Blackboard support, or if you want a Blackboard uh, sandbox course with the CTE template, I would contact CTE and one of us can set that up for you and kind of talk to you about the template. Um, and so what it is, is it, it just comes with all the defaults, and then we delete all the defaults and we just copy this course into it. Um, same means that you would copy any course to any other course uh, and we can do that. Um, so as our, so this is really a, the, the disappearing course is, um, uh, oh, so if you have taught a course in the past, it's not gonna disappear. They sometimes clean things up every like 10 years or something, um, but if it's, the only time that it's really a concern is prior to the beginning of a course. So if the course doesn't make, if there's not enough enrollment and the registrar's office cancels the course, that's when the, the course gets canceled and disappears. So it's not a past course, it's really only a concern for future courses. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yeah, if you have any more questions on those kinds of things, please let us know. Um, so I want to go to a little more, a little more detail in the templates. You can kind of see what we've got here. Um, so the, the, the getting started section contains links to start here, course information, syllabus and schedule and information about the instructor. Um, so the start here really is just kind of the, the main things that students need, need to know to get started. Uh, the course information is really kind of a, a build out of your syllabus in the online space with all of those details. Uh, and then the syllabus and schedule section tends to be just a, uh, an actual like paper copy or PDF copy of the syllabus itself. Um, in, in a course that I'm teaching, I have the paper copies of the syllabus and the schedule but under course schedule. I actually have copied the table into an item. And so you can kind of scroll through the schedule right there uh, in the course, which I think I use all the time. Um, so I don't know how much my students use it, but I use it a lot, so <laughs> it's dandy. Um, the course content section um, of the template includes the course modules, 
um, the Course Cafe and Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. So that Ultra thing is just a, a link to the web conferencing tool that we're using right now. The Course Cafe is the Q&A or FAQ discussion board that provides a central location for questions related to the course. Um, so it's just a discussion board that is kind of always open and lets students um, answer questions or ask questions. Um, so uh, in the course modules, which I uh, will go ahead and this is what it looks like in the course modules. Again, super tiny, so please use that little magnifying glass. Um, the course content here is broken into modules by content specific topics, by units or chapters of a textbook you're using, or by date or time frame. So this allows you to divide the content of your course into digestible pieces. Uh, so modules are built within folders and gives your course content structure, consistency, and form for online presentation and delivery to your students. It's similar to what we were talking about before, that this is the way that you really kind of guide your students through this is what you should be doing. Um, so we recommend that each module includes a module overview, uh, the module level learning objectives, that module task list, uh, which includes the activities, assignments, all the instructional materials. Uh, and then down below that will be the, the actual components where you build those out. So uh, we know that this level of module building can be challenging to put together, especially if you're doing your first online course uh, or you, and or you're doing it fairly soon. Um, and so I recommend focusing on organizing your material in a way that makes the most sense and communicating those clear expectations for your students. Uh, and that some of these really intricately built out kinds of things may be aspirational. They may be some things that you build to after teaching it a couple of times. Um, this last section that was in the template there is the resources section. So the, you can put whatever makes the most sense for your course in here. Um, some of the things that we include are uh, the migrate, a link to the migrates for students to quickly check grades for the course. A link to the Blackboard email feature to send email to um, all or selected users, students, or groups, uh, teaching assistants, instructors, or observers, uh, and the Blackboard help website for students. Uh, this is also where we've included some of those privacy and accessibility policies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and you can also include some uh, tips for success if you want. Uh, our, the template really only has one or two, um, but sometimes those are really can be course specific. Our uh, web conferencing tools and video recording tools. Um, so if you are going to be teaching synchronously, um, then web conferencing tools may be something that you want to consider. Um, so one of the uh, the Blackboard Cloud Ultra, which is one that we have here, is Blackboard's integrated web conferencing tool that you may choose to use for synchronous live sessions, virtual office hours or video recording. So other tools you may have access to on campus, maybe Microsoft Teams, your unit may have access to Zoom, um, but at the moment, the only two that are campus-wide are Collaborate and Teams. So while there's a lot of tools available, um, then there is really a considerable overlap in functions. So the main thing to be aware of as you're starting to plan what these may look like uh, is that you have this uh, shared desktop application the screen whiteboard that share feature. You have a chat feature, uh, raise hand and polling. Um, so sharing your screen can be used to demonstrate software, show examples and model analysis. Um, chat can be a great engagement tool for student response and questions, um, especially if uh, the numbers in your class make sharing audio or video challenging. Um, so uh, so I know a faculty member who has used the chat in the exit ticket manner. So she asked students to add a takeaway from the day to the chat before they exited. Uh, and the students who have been somewhat quiet um, all had very insightful things to add. And they all added something to the chat before they, they left, which showed me they were really paying attention. It was really great to see them. Uh, so the raise hand tool can also be used for class management. You can call on students to be able to turn mics on. Um, and then the polling feature. Uh, we talked about at the very beginning. Um, uh, also, I do want to mention, so I make no promises, but I did see an announcement on the Blackboard main page that apparently from the instructor, if you have an instructor uh, role, so I would assume moderators and presenters, 
Um, they are introducing a gallery view in Blackboard, which will allow you to see a multiple student cameras at the same time. I think it's set up to 25, which would be not, which would be pretty similar to Zoom. Um, I make no promises for how that's going to work, but I look forward to seeing how it goes. And then uh, last little bit here is some suggestions for some video recording tools. Um, so if you want to record a uh, small welcome or introduction videos, longer lecture videos, or even if you want to have your students record presentations, you may want to familiarize yourself with a few different recording uh, video recording options. Um, so I'm not going to go into a uh, ton of details about how to use them today, uh, but rather I just want to kind of tell you what's out there and some things to consider. Um, one thing to consider is Office 365, which is an online version of the Office product, um, and PowerPoint. So in PowerPoint, you can easily record your little face in the corner, as you can see with my little face down there. Uh, that this is I use that little tool in PowerPoint to put my little face down there so you can kind of see what it looks like on the slide. Um, as you can see, like it's actually pretty clear to see me as a human person, but it really doesn't take up much of the slide. Um, so, uh, and then uh, if recording per slide makes it pretty easy to update. Uh, and Office 365 is the online version of the Office product. So you can record directly online and share the link to the PowerPoint for students. Um, and likewise, students can also record in this medium and share the link with you and to others. I have found, I'm teaching this semester, and I've found that um, without being prompted, my students didn't realize that we were using VoiceThread, and so some of them just recorded in Office 365 or they recorded in, in PowerPoint, and they just knew how to do this and kind of went to it instinctually. So if students are, on, are comfortable using this tool, it's a great thing to do. So I've, I've been seeing that kind of student-led, so that might be a good thing to look into. Um, uh, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, so we're recording right now with the group. You can also use Collaborate to record by yourself. So um, you can just put your PowerPoint in here just like this and record. Uh, and there also is like, going to be uh, a little video, I think. Um, and then you can make that link available in your course. So these are pretty easy to access, but it can be challenging, cha challenging to work with for future versions. Um, so it's, in order to edit or reuse it, you really have to download the video, make changes, upload it. Um, so uh, I, would, I would definitely kind of consider what purposes you're using if you use Flyway Ultra. Um, the YouTube app, especially the mobile app, can be a good way to co uh, record quick or informal videos directly to YouTube, and then you can post the link in Blackboard. So I do these to introduce modules in my courses, um, and from hitting the play button to putting the link in Blackboard takes less than five minutes. So they're very quick welcome, intro welcome videos that are really less than a minute, and the whole process is very, very quick. Um, Camtasia is something that if you want to do more of kind of heavy duty video or more familiar with editing software, Camtasia can be a good option. You can screen share or record over PowerPoint. Um, you can do edits and then export to YouTube or the like. And Screencast-O-Matic is a screen capture tool that can do a screencast or voice over PowerPoint. Um, it's also great for doing a demo of something you want students to do or for recording instructions. Um, so there's an educator account for free that can record up to 15 minutes. Um, so many, many other tools out there. So try things out that, uh, and see what works for you and your needs. Um, and if you want help using these things or deciding what to use, you can reach out to us at the CTE or at the Office of Distributed Learning. Um, they do a lot of work with uh, people on this as well. So I'm going to go ahead and move to kind of my last question. Um, and then I will look and see what Jeremy put in the chat. Um, so essentially, we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, so please feel free to answer these questions um, about your experience using web conferencing or video tools uh, or the Blackboard features that you use. Um, and then also, if you have other questions. Um, so Jeremy, the Open Broadcast Studio is free and easy to use. Um, ooh, awesome. I'll have to check that out. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then, let's see, as I said, do you use the YouTube mobile app? Yes. Yeah. So I use the mobile app on my iPhone. Um, and so, uh, yes, I actually do all of my uh, welcome videos as unlisted. So it just goes straight to my little YouTube account. Uh, and then it doesn't automatically publish them, right? 
you can go in and you can choose. Actually, when I make the video on my phone, I choose that I want it to be unlisted. And so when it goes to YouTube, um, it's already unlisted. And then I just grab the link and then I pop it into Blackboard. Okay, Tinsley is talking about using rubric, um, adding it. Yeah, if you have it in the assignment in Blackboard, so that it just shows up right there um, in the, the back end of the Grade Center. I agree, it goes really quickly. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much, um, Casey and participants. And again, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, please feel free to um, stick around and ask questions if you want. Uh, otherwise, have a great day. And thanks for being here and having great contributions.